Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Ruth Miller from Embroidered Realism. Ruth, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I'm glad to be here and Beth as well. Thank you. Yeah, glad Thank to have you. you. All right. The, the first thing out of the gate is when I was doing research on you, I never imagined that your you know, embroidered portraiture is what is is your main thing, and you have so much other things to offer. But I never imagined that you were doing life-sized embroidered portraiture until I saw that one picture with a guy with some leaves around, and and I saw clearly that his head was life-size. What what got you doing things life-size? That is just what an undertaking. Well, uh, I guess it started back when I was in school. When I was in college, uh, you had to make big work in order to be, quote, professional. So uh, that, that led me to to want to make big pieces to be taken seriously. But there's a, also a practical reason. I'm using woolen yarns in order to uh, create my images. And I want to get really mm, smooth interact, smooth combinations of yarn, of colors, I should say, not yarn, but the colors. I want the, the color gradations to be not choppy and rough looking. Yeah. So to accommodate the, the size of the yarn, I, I use a larger image. And every piece is not huge in itself, but they're still life size. If I want to make a smaller piece, I just crop the image. Yeah. So that, you know, it's, they're not all five feet. <laughs> you know, that, that's a, that, that's a huge undertaking to think of five yes, it would be. embroidery. Yeah. But, oh. Well, I, it, okay. So that asks, that, that brings up the other question then. In today's world of 500 million uh, thread types, why stick with wool uh, wool yarn? Is it just because it gives you a texture you're after, or what is it that it does for you? Some of it's automatic programming. The uh, the the work that inspired me at the beginning of my career, when I when I was still a teacher, a teenager rather, I didn't even have a career, but I had seen some woven, um, not portraits but figurative art, and it was done in wool. I had prior to that been using embroidery floss. So when I made the switch, you know, and I thought, well, with the switch, you know, I could, I could make bigger pieces faster. But, um, well, the, it accommodates the size of the yarn mostly. Okay. So it's dramatic. Uh, it's practical. Um, there are lots of reasons. This particular yarn, though, is it, very beautiful. It comes in 300 plus colors from the uh, Pattern Iron Company. It, it's different than any other wool that I've ever used or, or seen for that matter, in that it looks, there's a slight sheen to it that makes it look like well conditioned human hair. No. Oh. So, they're, they're little micro effects that you really can't see unless you're in the presence of the work, mm -hmm. but that add to it. That's interesting in itself because we don't generally think of wool as, as really offering much more than just fuzz, but because uh, um, that's it, what, three ply, three ply, so you use one ply most of the time? Yes, I started off using all three because I said, well, this will help make the work go faster. But... <laughs> I found that when I wanted to uh, do the flesh portions, I want the, wanted the effect to be much smoother. So that led me to separate the plies. Oh, okay. But then I got used to that look. And it, though it takes a little longer, I, I liked the, the flatness of it. Yeah. But the interesting thing about this particular yarn is that even the one ply has a twist. Each ply is twisted two strand twists okay so that that makes it a very strong yarn 
the you know the the fabric backing that I use is relatively coarse, so you can imagine that with the needle going in and out, in and out, it would wear those fuzz fuzzy wool bits off. But right. it doesn't with this yarn. Oh, because that was that was the other thing that when I saw you using wool, I thought, boy, a few passes through the ground cloth and and you're going to have fuzz everywhere. But it doesn't do that, huh? No, and apparently this wool was made to be suitable for Persian rugs, so that they would take quite a bit of, uh, of abrasion, say. Yeah. You know, in the course of the lifetime of a rug. Right. So I, I'm really happy with this. Now, at life size pieces, you must own a truckload of of pattern A and wool. Uh, yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. I uh, I got lucky early on in my career. I got a grant that was really project based, but you know I cheated and bought enough wool for all the pro projects to come in the future. <laughs> you know, I you know I wanted to make the most of it. Yep. <laughs> hey, can't That's blame good you planning. there. Good planning. Yep. Good planning. Yep. Good planning. <laughs> <laughs> now, from yeah. from what I read, you grew up in a, a creative and supportive uh, home, in to that to lead you to do this kind of work. Se seemed like you, you, your mother uh, was there and taught you, and you really had an opportunity as a child to to develop your skills. Oh yes, yes. My mother was uh, an angel, as is everyone's mother, but. Uh, <laughs> She was a teacher as well. She was a public school teacher. So education itself was important to her. Cultural education was important to her. So my whole background is well-rounded. And you might say, well, what, what effect does that have on the art you do now? Say, you know, I, I had one class in sight singing. What does that have to do with anything? Well, I had never heard of sight singing, but, um, Every single thing that we learn that's in, in our experience can be used later. We don't know at the time, but it will come in handy for the narrative aspects of the work that you have. When you get ready to tell your story, you, you sort of mm, draw on, on all these past experiences. So I, I never would have known. We had dancing lessons. Uh, you know, we went to, to plays and, and theater and opera. Uh, and we learned to play uh, musical instruments. I took the, the violin and the piano, which I, I can't, can't even read music now. Sorry to say, <laughs> but <laughs> it all it all impacts the art. Yeah. So that so so you you got a, a well-rounded upbringing. So you had exposure to all types of things, which really allowed you to to choose what yes. interested you. Yes, I did, and and my mother was furthermore beyond that. She wasn't pushy in any one direction. She she saw that I drew all the time, and she nurtured that. Of course, my sister and brother, you know had the same opportunities, but she, she watched to see what each child was drawn to. Uh -huh. So yeah. I, I, I recommend that to any mothers out there. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, so fathers. The, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, um, uh, the drawing then that started early and you've never quit drawing. Oh yeah. Yes. That, that I, I still have one drawing from the third grade where I had made a, a Mother's Day card for my mother. So I still have the the page where I printed slowly, you know, the the words for the card and another piece on uh, newsprint, no less. I don't know how it lasted, but uh, yeah, early on. Yeah. And that's still, uh, drawing is still really the, the, the basis, the start for your art today then is, uh, I mean, you, you still use drawing yes. as your starting point. Yes, I, I don't consider, I never considered myself a painter. I don't feel I have an aptitude for paint. My work looks sort of painterly, but it's more like um, 
the kind of image one would make with colored pencil. And mm -hmm. that it's, it's a series of small strokes. There are no broad washes of color. Although with yarn, you can duplicate a broad wash of color. But uh, no, I, I'm a, a draftsman really. And drawing is my first love. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting. Some of your work, oh, go ahead, Beth. Some of your work, uh, especially some of the yeah. faces, I see um, like a Van Gogh influence on the way you use um, the, like his, how he had his paint strokes. And I see that in your, in your work. Um, so I just well, see that in. Um, thank you. Uh, Van Gogh was an influence. I wouldn't have said in the, in the type of strokes he used more in the coloring and the textural mm -hmm. aspects of it. But, um, uh, Beth, it might be that Van Gogh's used okay maybe the stitching has has a comparable effect to the type of brush strokes that he used just stitching by itself not because it's mine but the nature of stitching being um discrete uh particles of color for each each stitch that might be sort of van gogh like i hadn't thought of that yes, yes. very much so very much so. It was interesting, the quote you made about school. I never attended schools to acquire degrees or certifications because I never imagined any financial award. Knowledge was its own re reward, the prime mover, the source of delight. Now, we, we all, uh, mo oh, most, of us, most of us go to school <laughs> to make money at some point. But <laughs> yes, and I have a feeling that's the reason we're finding our as a country in the situation we're in because money cannot be the basis for how we live our lives it's just not wise no it's too simple that's that's what it is it's too simple it doesn't take into account all the facets of life but you know i it wasn't uh my my better character really that that drove that decision i i just happen to be interested in how life works uh -huh. now i think i bring that to my art but but that was the main driver behind that uh if you if your education is so single single pointed and focused on 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 just money then you lose the big picture and you don't even know if you're in the in the right industry and in the the right company you had you don't know if you're headed in the right direction if your education is too narrow okay i'm out it doesn't feed the soul, <laughs> it doesn't feed the soul does it? it if you're just if you're just going after a degree to get that degree and to get money at the end well not you're only missing something yeah but not only doesn't it feed the soul Every every job we took in, and I, I've take I've had a lot of jobs from painting faces on mannequins to uh, well regular retail, uh, postal service, or oh, everything. You don't know how your your action fits into the human scheme of things unless you know what else is out there, and if you focus too early in life. Um, you don't know if you're going to end up headed in just the wrong direction. Not only will it not be satisfying, you might decide, well, this isn't even, well, it's harmful. <laughs> mm. Say, you know, say mm -hmm. you said, well, I, I want to make a lot of money and you end up in, in uh, I don't know, oil drilling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, very few people decide to embroider for money, but, you know, you you might find that that your career has has sent you in in a direction you didn't want to go. Oh, I'm gonna have to think about this a little bit. Yeah, I I, I agree with you, but uh, wow, I, I have to look back at my life path here now. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> oh God, you're still young. You're still young, well, Gary. Well, not not only that, it, it brought you to embroidery and fiber art, nevertheless. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. 
So, you know, there's, there's not one path. Yeah. Talk to me about the Fashion Institute of Technology where you learned, was it leather making, shoe making, and bag making? That, you talk about, yes, yes. You talk about a whole other world of things, of art. <laughs> oh, yes. I loved it. I loved it. Um, Fashion Institute is uh, is a college that is is set up to service all phases of the fashion industry. Uh -huh. Now, at the time that I went there, I was an adult. I had children. I worked as a typist. But you know, once I heard about the courses being open to everyone, I uh, I took leather making first. I think. And, and that, that opened the way, well, it was required. I really wanted to learn to make shoes and I did take a shoe making course, but leather working was required first to get you comfortable with the materials. And then from there, I still liked leather. And so I went into um, bag making, but, but to learn how to, how to, well, to be in the company of people who take their, their work seriously, who, who value quality over quantity, who, who, who want to know everything from the financial aspect to, you know, the creation of the, the product itself, all that, you know, no one there. I've go, I've gone to a lot of schools and, and, I can say with, with surety that, that no one there goes to waste their time or, or to an, indulge a, a parent <laughs> or, or anything that they all have a commitment or a love for fashion. Yeah. Did you ever make a pair of shoes that you actually wore? Yes, I did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. I made it. It, it, yeah, at the end of the class, I was able to, wear, you know, they, they gave you a, a last to make your shoes on. I got the last to fit my foot. So, you know, I was able to wear the shoes. They were a pair of mules. They weren't difficult, you know, but but they I've worn them. The soles are scuffed, you know, <laughs> but they held up, too. It's been a long time. <laughs> That's great. So I can see that as a professor. Your, your requirement is... Yeah, you got to make shoes, but you got to be able to walk two miles in them without doubling over in pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fun. So what what is it that gets you to embroidery? So we have all of these life experiences. Drawing is your first love. You have uh, exposure to all kinds of art. What is it that gets you to embroidery as a way of expressing your art? when you know painting uh photography whatever it might be would would work just as well why why is it needle and thread well uh, i didn't consider photography i i've never been a good photographer but um uh, every school that i've gone to even elementary school emphasized painting and with paint painting is messy I, before I had children, I was prissy enough to say, oh, it's, it's gooey, it's nasty, I, you know, I don't like it, you know, so, you know, after so you're you one of those kids, you're one of those diapers kids. For, for one year, <laughs> yes, but once you change diapers, you know, it, then uh, paint's not so bad. But um, at the time I made the switch, I didn't have any children. Okay. So, you know, I, I thought I already, I already learned to embroider as, as, you know, I don't know, maybe an eight, seven, eight year old. So I was already familiar and somewhat facile with that medium. You know, I used it just to put the little daisies on the, uh, on the tablecloth or whatever, or the apron, you know, things that probably people don't even use now. Right. But, you know, I, I loved it. I love the slowness of it. I love the fact that I got to work with my aunt who, who embroidered, you know, as, a, as an adult, certainly. 
you know, after after work, you know, for her own enjoyment. But the it's not I don't think it's that far of a stretch. Once you once you throw out the messiness of of paint, <laughs> you know, you have to have some other medium. Yeah. You know, and I, I like it because it, it can make a line that's suitable to drawing, certainly. Yeah. Because even even with a tablecloth, you're drawing. Right. I get right. I get a sense that there was a special connection with your aunt. Oh yes. My aunt my aunt Mildred. Oh, she was also the first person who I knew who made money at home from craft. Oh. Now she she worked as a as a, a waitress really at at Chock Full of Nuts, but uh, later when she had other jobs, she she would make the crafts at home. She'd crochet and embroider and things like that, mostly crocheting. But she took those things to her jobs and sold them to her coworkers, and I didn't know people could do that. So that was like an early introduction to working at home for money. Yeah. So even though she didn't, she didn't ask much money and, and didn't make much money, but the very idea, you know, I thought everybody had a job, yeah. <laughs> you know, Yeah. but I didn't know you could make a job. <laughs> so she, so she sh showed you the path then that, that wasn't going and getting a regular yes. nine to five drive job then. Yes. It was a long time, though, before I followed that path. <laughs> you know, I had lots and lots of jobs. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, the I, that's what that goes back to my earlier point, that whatever you learn is not wasted. When it came time for me to say, okay, uh, I'm going to take the leap. Uh, now, when I took the leap of faith, I waited till my youngest had graduated from high school. So that theoretically, at least, you know, all my children could be self-supporting. They could mm -hmm. sign a contract and, and get an apartment. And, you know, if, if I slid into poverty and homelessness following my art, that they <laughs> would be protected. They were, they were able to protect right. themselves. Right. So, right. so, you know, <laughs> you know, but still everything, nothing's wasted. Everything yeah. can be used. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the um, did you was your art always portraiture, or did you start with some other form of needlework and then work your way to portraiture? Well, I I started with decorative patterns. You know, as I mentioned in the in the uh, tablecloths and what have you. But for myself. The work was always figurative, you know, unless someone gave an assignment to do a landscape or still life or what have you. But my work by choice was always figurative, but I always worked from imagination. It's only when I got to Cooper Union and was really forced to work from life <laughs> that I decided I liked it. And also I could do it fairly quickly. Um, I teach drawing now sometimes and what there are lots of people who look at my work and say, oh, I can never do that. But I start the way my teacher did in showing you how one creates a likeness with a, a, a non-figurative, not non-figurative, but non-human object. Mm -hmm. A human face is very complicated. So I start my classes with a toothpaste box. Oh. And if you can get it to look like that, I'll get something more complicated and more complicated and we'll work on it till we get to the face. And then I, I show people who are doubters that they can do this. Yeah. Well, that was the other thing that I wondered about because you know, the, the, human, the human body in general is difficult to create through art. And you just have a real style to it. Did that come fairly naturally, or did you have to work pretty hard to get to the point where you could could create the the realistic looks that you get? Well, even when I worked from imagination, 
Um, I was pretty good. <laughs> okay. It that way. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was I was good enough to get into Cooper Union. Cooper Union is a school that was essentially free at the time. All you had to buy was supplies and uh-huh. pay for administrative uh, costs. But um, the cl- the tuition was entirely free, but you had to pass the entrance test. Oh. So I was good enough to pass the entrance test to get in it. I had already been to uh, uh, an arts high school, but... Um, I, I don't say, sorry to say, I, I didn't learn quite so much there. But at <laughs> Cooper Union, my dr- drawing teacher was excellent. As, as all the teachers were excellent, but I, I really took to the way he he taught the classes. Yeah. So, so will you you re- rephrase your question again as far as 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 being specific? Specific about getting a likeness. Well, it just it just seems that. You know, or for, was that in your question? Yeah, for so many people, it's just difficult to create the human body, no matter what portion of it it is, and and you just your your art is just so beautifully done, and you know the lines and the way you handled you know the facial features, and so I you know, I just wondered if that was was uh, came naturally or was just a lot of work and then of course you know there's doing that with a with a a piece a pencil and a piece of paper but but then to do that with needle and thread to me is like two more levels higher of difficulty well uh yes it is um i take i'm not fast at all even after all these years and Every t- while I'm stitching, say it takes a year to make a piece. While I'm stitching, I'm not drawing. So in that year, I'm going to get rusty. Uh. And believe it or not, every time I start a piece, I think, oh, my goodness, how am I going to do this? You know, so you, you do you need to practice and you need to keep in practice. But um, as I work, I I continually Hmm. Make adjustments. I'm just the way with. I start off with pencil and paper. The the, the I have an eraser. That's the first set of adjustments. <laughs> but when I'm stitching, I'm still making adjustments. And sometimes, every, in fact, with every single piece, I have to take my tweezers and fingernail scissors and pull out the mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. It, it, there's never a, a a time where okay, it's just you know one stitch after another. It's not all planned in my head. It, it comes out as I'm doing it. Yeah. So do your pieces kind of speak to you as you stitch on them? Do they do they say, oh, I need this? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> but that that's always. Uh, something I consider uh, unfortunate uh, <laughs> because it means then I have to change something. But um, yes, mostly I, I hope that, okay, if things were ideal, the, the, the look of the piece and the narrative would be entirely planned out before I even started with the first stitch. Because anytime... I, you know, get inspired in the middle of it. Something has to go. Something has to be undone. So um, I, I try. But, you know, that's, that's, that's also a, a pleasant aspect of stitching. Anyone who stitches is comfortable in that zone where you stitch after stitching, all, all your stress winds down and you're focused on you know, the fabric in front of you, you know, that's, that's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a mitigated, unfortunate situation, I'll say. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it, if you, for view, for listeners to your podcast who go to my website later, 
you will see where I have actually described what that's like to change my mind as I go along. There's a piece called teacup fishing where I describe that and I show different images, you know, of that process. Yeah, that was most yeah, enlightening. I really enjoyed that because uh, it really took us through how that piece developed and, and what was in your head in terms of, of the art and how you wanted to express it. That was very good, yes. So thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. It, it happens to some degree with every piece, but it was dramatic in, in that piece in that I really changed the structure of it, the, um, the layout, if you will. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's particularly good one, yeah. The, um, and, and that was the other thing, you know, Beth and I uh, have talked about this many times is that calming influence that that uh, doing needlework has on us and uh, you know Bess even talked about going to to give blood and her blood pressure is too low because she's been stitching so they can't oh. uh, they can't take her um, but but when you, oh, when you, wow. yeah when, when you say you work seated because that's what calms you down so that uh, you, you sit down and, and you just enter your own little world with your with your needle and thread huh? Yes, well, my world is a little bigger because I live in audio books. But um, <laughs> yes, I, I, in New York, I used to have wood floors. So it was comfortable to sit on the floor. You know, it's not icy. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, if you, can, if you can picture, say, a piece like teacup fishing, where there's, you know, it's about four feet high, I should say, <laughs> roughly. Um, in order to, to accommodate and not have to carry that weight, it's best to be on the floor so that you know, I don't have to raise my arms. I don't have to lift it while I'm stitching. So, um, in, oh, huh, I, I, I think... Some people would like to know what it's like to work on such a large piece. Yeah, um, I'd very much like to know about that. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I I generally start with the eyes, whether they're in the middle of the piece or wherever, because I consider the eyes to be on a plane behind, say, the eyelids, so they're inside the the flesh of the face. So the face is something that I have to get correct. If, you know, if I, if I want to make any errors, if I want to rush through, I can't rush through the face. Okay, I want to stop you right there, Ruth. Because when, when I was being taught okay. photography, I was told if you're, if you're photographing animals, humans included, that no matter what you do, you make sure those eyes are in focus because the image will never work if the eyes are out of focus. And then when we look at your art, those eyes are just are just so powerful. I mean, they just set the stage for everything. I, I assume that, that you work very hard to get the eyes just right? Uh, yes. And um, the, the, piece, the whole piece can't go forward if the eyes aren't correct. Yeah. Um, what would I say? Okay, aside from being behind the eyelids and, and me wanting to have the stitches of the eyelids go over the stitches of the eyeball, the, I have to get the, the proportions right so that the left eye is the proper distance from the right eye. Oh. Now, every face is not facing forward, so you can't use... Uh, some sort of uh, theoretical framework for what a face looks like. If the face is turned in any way, that's going to affect, you know, not only the distance between the eyes, but the size of the eye. Right. The, the eyes that are farther away from the plane are going to be smaller. The eye, excuse me, I should say, it's going to be smaller than the eye that's closer to the, the front plane, to the viewer. Okay, so the eyes are not going to be, 
people's eyes are not the same size right to left anyway. Oh. But, you know, certainly you have to get you have to get it so that there's some sense that this is a solid three dimensional object and not a two dimensional, say, photograph. OK, mm -hmm. or yeah. even painting. But I in fact, while I do use photographs to to uh, draw from, I try my best so that the finished piece does not look like it's been drawn from a photograph. Mm -hmm. I want the realism of the photograph, but without the uh, differences in contrast, say, you, mm -hmm. you, you know, when you have a photograph, it's very high contrast, it'll be maybe almost all black or white, say, and yeah. very little shading in between. Okay, all photographs have some little bit of distortion in, in the contrast. So I try my best to remove that so that it looks as if I'm looking at the object directly and not at the photograph directly. Oh, okay. So you'll uh -huh. see a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people who, a lot of people work from photographs because it's just not, it's just too unwieldy to have someone sit for you for, you know, three months. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, right. <laughs> so, you know, um, but, but so we use photographs, but I don't want to make a, a, an art piece of a photograph. Uh, you know, and I always uh, encourage my students to go beyond what is what is right right in front of them. You know, you'll see a lot of work that's not needlework that's made from photographs, and it looks like a photograph. If you, you know, not you, do you agree? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I see yeah, that all I, the time. I you see know, it in art. No quilts. matter how fancy it is, otherwise, yeah, yeah. You see it where? In art quilts. Where did um, Where did you say you see it, Beth? In art uh, quilts. Yeah. Well, but you will also see it in um, in paintings. If you mm. look at at photographs of paintings, you can see. Oh, that was made with a photograph. Hmm. So you're looking at the photograph of a painting of a photograph. And that little bit of that, that psychological distance, that, that visual distance comes through. So I'm, I'm working against that. I want to be painterly. That's why I have, you know, often used colors that are not in the photograph, that, that are imaginative. But still, even when I'm going way out there, I don't want it to look like a photograph of some imaginative out object. Every time we talk to one of these artists, I got to go look at other stuff <laughs> to see, mm -hmm. just to see what they're talking about. Okay. All right. All right. Now I got to go study okay, some more but, stuff. Well, any, anything that I tell you, please, you know, stop me if it's not clear. I'll look for some other words. No, no, I, because, I'm getting it. Because, you know, I'm with my, <laughs> uh, oh, okay, okay. That's one of the things that I aim for, even in, you know, with the combination of narrative and drawing and color and everything, my objective is to communicate. I don't want to mystify anybody. Life is already mystify, mystifying. I should say, yeah. and um, if, you know, whenever I propose a story or a narrative, it's so that it can be of help to whoever is viewing it, mm -hmm. you know, help to understand me, to understand themselves or life or whatever it is, but help in some way. So if I blow smoke on you, you know, I'm getting in the way of that. Yeah. Yeah, every every one of your pieces seems to have some kind of a story behind it. Is that, does that evolve as you're working on it? Because it, it takes you a year plus to do these life-size things. So that, that's a lot of thinking time. 
does that evolve over time or do you start in your mind many times with a story? Uh, yes, sometimes I start with a story. I prefer to start with a story. Um, uh, for one group of, of pieces that I did, I had my story in mind. And then when the, the model came, the whole story, two models, in fact, the stories went out the window and I found that I was not a good enough photographer to capture the story with the models. That's another thing. It helps if you're going to look for a model. Uh, if you if your objective is to tell stories, it look it's helpful to find a model who's an actor. Mm. You know, they don't have to be a professional actor, be, but they have to know how to be the story instead of just holding a pose. Because when when the the model is is posing, if they're thinking of something else, their body is following their minds. So you'd be surprised. Mm. I found that it really helps, you know, to have someone who is even an actor by nature. Now, uh, as far, okay, say I got there and, and wow, these photographs are terrible. What am I going to do now? I always shoot while the model is there. So sometimes I come up with something lucky. They're doing something natural already. And, uh, now, if I sit and look and look and look and look at the shot itself, sometimes a story suggests itself. You know, what would I be thinking if I were doing such and such a thing? You know, that yes. type of thing. And so a narrative can develop that way. But also, you know, say in the, in the case of teacup fishing, I knew what the overall narrative was, but I just changed the details. You know, I, I looked for what would make the narrative more explicit, but I didn't change the narrative itself, which mm. was to, to, you know, not narrow oneself in the, in the search for whatever you can get out of life. You know, that's the main theme of teacup fishing. So, but, so all the changes you see did not change that narrative, okay. that underlying narrative. Yeah, yeah. One of the okay. things I but, love to... You know... Go mm -hmm. ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. One of the things I loved about so no, much... No, I'm, I'm, I'm through. Okay. <laughs> One of the things I love about so much of your work is, is we have a main character, but then you have so many other things in the overall piece of art that enhance the meaning of that art or carry a message. And um, uh, particularly, because in, in, what is it you have, uh, ones that are fully covered where you cover the entire ground cloth, what do we call those? Uh, uh, and then the tapestries. Ones, yeah, tapestries, and then you have ones where you have open space, and and you use that space and carry little messages. Uh, uh, the trade-off standoff was one that really, really hit me. Uh, where you you deliver so much more than just the main character. Oh well, thank you. I I, I like that piece as well. Now that was one of the instances where the models just happened to be standing <laughs> so <laughs> i said oh let me let me capture that you know they they were a couple so um they they happened to be standing uh together at the time so i said well let me do the feet and um but if you just if you can imagine the photograph before that piece so it's, it's just someone standing on the wood floor, two people standing, facing each other on the wooden floor. But then, you know, my mind says, well, what does it mean to face another person? And especially as part of a couple. Um, what's it like to be part of a couple? It, it, it's not always good. 
Sometimes it's almost never good. <laughs> um, but usually there's a, you know, there's a combination of good and bad things or expected and unexpected things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I got, I got to, to think about that. And luckily that didn't take me a year, but even in that little bit of time, I found a way to elaborate on, on that message. Yeah. You know, of what, what is it to be part of a couple? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's striking. There's no question about it. Tell, tell me about when I, when I look at, oh, like when you, you say teacup fishing is a four foot piece, there's no way you sit and face that thing proper side up and stitch that whole thing. That just to develop the skill to turn that and stitch from all four sides must have taken an awful lot of work and you must, your mind constantly adjusting uh, as you stitch. That, it's got to be an incredible challenge. Uh, yes, it, it was, and it, and it is. Anytime I have a very large piece, um, if you can imagine me, say, sitting on the floor with maybe a chair on my right and on my left to balance the work, so that way I can, uh, okay, what, what did I, I see you looking, Beth. Let me, let me, uh, I, I know what you, I know what if, you're saying. If, it's if sitting on the floor it. that gets me. It's split, sitting on the floor that's getting me. <laughs> okay. Maybe I have a cushion, but. <laughs> oh, okay. That's better. <laughs> okay. So I'm on, on, I'm on my cushion and, um, and you know, the, the, the work is balanced on something on the right and something on the left. But um, that allows me to see the top and feel the bottom without having to hold up the frame at the same time. Okay, so that's one aspect of it. Now, um, I try after the first piece, you know, which was incredibly difficult. That was flower. Uh, that's a self-portrait. That was bigger than teacup fishing. That's like five by three. Um, after doing that one, I made sure that the eyes were not in the very center of the piece <laughs> because that's where the most struggle is going to be. Okay, so once, say I get the eyes and the face done. Okay, so the less difficult places are on the edges of the canvas, number one. Uh, but I have to figure out not, well, I, I have to, in order to reach, I, I don't have five foot arms. Right. So, right. so I have to reach always from at, at least, uh, a foot and a half away. Oh, at least, I don't know, two thirds of my arm length to get to the center of that piece. So from the top and the bottom, it's even further. So I have to shift, but I try to make the major decisions facing it head on. Uh -huh. But the other thing to take into consideration is that everybody is going to first see each piece from a distance. So I'm working at it close up. So I've got to put the stuff down and go across the room and look at it and see, is it, is it working? Do the colors that look good close up? Are they having the right effect at a distance at yeah. five feet or 10 or 20 feet away? If I can manage it, if I'm in a big, I happen to have a large studio so I can get maybe ooh, 15, maybe even 20 feet away. But, um, you know, that's a consideration in itself because even the, the idea of, of wearing glasses, I, I wear reading glasses now to stitch with. So, um, you know, everything is crystal clear when I'm looking at it, but maybe the values are off at a distance. Maybe it doesn't look so clear, you know, because I don't like to overdo it. So what can look clear from a distance is overdone when you close up. Yeah. So I have to really sort of make that ne negotiation with myself. <laughs> you know, and try to figure out how, how I see things and how others will see things. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting to think about because for for Beth and me, you know, if if something is more than 20 inches on the long side, that's huge for us. But right. you're talking about feet, and you know, and yeah, you you talk about that stitching under a magnifier, and then if, if sooner or later you really need to step back to a reasonable distance to view it, because under a magnifier, it's just you see all the flaws. And for you, it's got to be across the room so you can get a proper perspective on it. That's uh, yeah, a whole different world. Yep. Yes. Yes. And that, that's one of the reasons that it takes so long, because you have to count the time that it, it takes to get up and walk away. And then <laughs> right. when you walk away, you have to stand there and think about it. Right. You know, what's working, right. what isn't working. Right. Right. Yeah. And you have to remember when you get back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be a problem for me already. Yeah, I, yeah, I can forget quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, now you, the other part, and now I'm really blown away by this. But you talked about um, stitching five to six hours a day, five days a week is optimal. And now that I know that you're not sitting in a chair, you're sitting on the floor on a cushion. Uh, I, what about the ergonomics of that? Or, or have you just adapted to the point where you're just quite comfortable on a cushion on the floor stitching all day long? Well, actually, I, I was comfortable. I, I, if I had really had my druthers, I would have been a dancer. Uh. So because we had, we had dancing lessons from age six. So I took dance classes up until maybe age hmm, 50. <laughs> wow. So, wow. so I was come, I'm somewhat flexible. So, you know, when I worked at the post office, I had no energy for dancing, but aside from that, those five years, um, I, I was somewhat athletic. So I was, you know, being on the floor is not difficult in itself. And it's, you know, maybe even helpful. Oh, but, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, no doubt it's helpful. I tell you, I wish I had that flexibility. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, you, uh, but you, you were asking something. You well, were just, asking something else? Yeah, I was just curious uh, about the ergonomics. And it sounds like if, if you have that kind of flexibility, then you're able to, to uh, sit and stitch for long lengths of time, and I'm, you know, I'm sure you're up and down, but um, you know, for, for most of us to sit on the floor first would be a huge feat, and then, and then to stitch uh, <laughs> on, a four, on a four foot piece would be even that much more, but uh, so you have that flexibility working for you. Okay, I get it. Well, let me, let me put it this way. If I were to work from a chair, I would then have to find something higher than that to prop the work up on. Yeah. So uh, it's easier to to get get the body in shape to sit on the floor than it is to try to figure out which you know you can't move the dresser. You know that <laughs> the dresser maybe accommodates one side. You know, so that's that's a consideration because I I don't really unless I'm really caught up in something. I don't turn the work over to the reverse side. Now, every now and then I'll, I'll make tangles on the back. So then I have to turn it over. But I found a way to work so that I don't, for the most part, tangle up the yarn on the reverse side. Otherwise, that would be an issue. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, funny thing. Funny thing, I, I went to get, I went to get a flower uh, that, that first, uh, uh, piece that I did. Flower was the first piece I made as a, as, as a professional when I said, okay, I'm a professional now. <laughs> <laughs> but so that was my first piece. And I used myself as a model because not only do I come cheap, but I, you know, I wouldn't have to explain it to anybody. So, yeah. okay, I finished the piece and then I, I was bringing it to the framer and she picked it up out of the, uh, out of the wrapping uh, backside up. And she's like, oh, this is fabulous. You know, but she's looking at all the knots in the, 
She hadn't seen the actual piece. She's just <laughs> looking at the back. So <laughs> Mm. Uh, that yeah i got a chuckle mm. out of that too yeah yeah thank you very much but please look at the proper mm. side yes <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah now i'm curious people who exhibit their work that that in itself is a huge undertaking to do an exhibit but i'm always curious what do you learn from doing an exhibit do you, I assume you're there for at least a couple of sessions where you talk to people who come in and look at your artwork. Do you do you learn things from that? Do you uh, just talking with people? Um, yes, I learn how to talk to people. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> when I when I was a teenager, I felt that my skill level was pretty much like it is now. It wasn't, but I thought it was. Uh, but certainly I thought it was good enough to make art that was sellable. Mm -hmm. So the unfortunate thing was that I was very shy and I didn't know how to approach uh, a gallery owner, uh, let, let alone a museum or, or any of these. Uh, how do you look for a, a collector? I, I had no idea. I didn't know how I would even, you know, what to wear, what to say, all this stuff. You know, you, if you're an artist, you have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But I was lucky enough to, uh, to, you know, early on in my career, I had gone to a frame store and the, uh, the clerk asked me whether I intended to sell this type of work. And I, when I said yes, he said, well, you should try to uh, postpone selling, you know, put a, put aside the idea of selling and, and try to get it exhibited at places where you don't have to sell it so that you can make a name for yourself. And then the, because the, the prices you get are to a large degree based on the name that you have and mm. the fame. That's why we see all kind of all kinds of art and we say well i could do that you know and but you know they they have a name well how did they get a name very often it's notoriety but every every now and then it's just based on the skill that they have but there are so many artists who who are really good and no one knows about them so yeah. it's, it's not based on talent um but anyway, what, what can one learn from an exhibition? Um, the primarily, tri primarily what I learned was um, how to talk to people. So yeah. I had to approach people the way I'm approaching you. You, you are strangers to me now. So I, I find out what your interests are you know, why, why have you come to see the work? Um, are you an artist? Are you not an artist? Uh, my first and uh, solo show, this, the, or the solo show that I had, I, I was allowed to actually uh, design the entire show myself. Mm. And so that type of thing was built into the show so that people could see uh, the things that I'm describing to you today as to how I actually work, what changes I make, you know, what, how an artist thinks, you know, what, 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 what kind of judgments are made as in all types of things, and not just the look, but the narrative, uh, but, and, and all other things that I can't think of right this minute, but all kinds of judgments get made. So I wanted people to understand those things be, because when they go to see an exhibition, you usually see a finished piece and you either like it or you don't, but it is so much more valuable to me to, uh, to have people understand, well, what is it to be an artist? I want people to be artistic in the way they live. Uh, my art was made as 
as a way to assist myself into living better. I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to have a better character. Uh, I wanted to be a stronger person. Uh, so all these challenges that the business side of, of art brings forth, the exhibitions and all that, um, that was there to develop, you know, my social skills. As a, as a shy person, I avoided social situations. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that right there, it, you know, if you want to go sell your art now, are you used to speaking to people? Can you actually right. describe in words why you did this and what it was it that you actually did, aside from how it looks? You yeah. know, I, I very seldom don't, I very seldom get back any feedback as to, you know, that will help me say, well, okay, I'll make a different kind of piece next time. Oh, That's okay. not what I have gotten from exhibitions, for instance. Um, I used to sell crafts. So when I sold crafts, that would help me there. But mm -hmm. for artwork, it doesn't help me because it's so subjective. Art is so subjective that, you know, <laughs> other people they might say, well, you know, I would like you to make a piece of my Uncle Harry. I really loved him. You know, but that doesn't help me as an artist <laughs> in deciding what to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, and in, in fact, I have, I have really been loath to accept uh, commissions. You know, I really like to chart my own path forward and decide, you know, what I'm going to work on. Um, yeah, I wondered. I wondered about. I wondered about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wondered about commissions because because yes. they 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 dictate what you must do, which seems always seems contrary to what an yes. art, a, an artist wants. Yeah. Yes, and you you have to find something valuable in the person you're given to work with. So you, in my case, I would have to find a narrative, and they would have to give me a photograph that isn't posed with a smiley face, you know, wow. or whatever, you know, <laughs> Uncle Harry thought he should look like at the moment. <laughs> you know, very few people are going to give you a, a photograph that you can work with, yeah. you know. And my, my art pieces are not all that dramatic, but I try to allow for the, you know, the slightest bit of drama yeah. and, you know, and, and not being a good photographer, I can't even offer my own services to shoot the person, <laughs> you know, if they're still living. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. That's, that's key right there. Yeah. They're still living. Right. Yep. Well, Ruth sure have enjoyed it. Thanks so much for making the time to do this. This has been a real, real terrific experience. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. May I add one more thing? Well, oh, sure. a couple of things. Uh, your folks might want to know where to buy the yarn. Now, yes. there's a, a a place. The place I used to go to is now closed, but I see that that there's something called florilegium.com. That's F L O R I L E G I U M as in mother. Dot com. And they sell pattern iron yarns. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we didn't discuss fabric. I prefer, if I can, to get a coarse linen. And the reason for that is that linen does not stretch. Cotton stretches. It, uh, even when you pull it tightly, you know, uh, 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 once you start stitching, the, the yarn will distort the fabric. So linen has almost no stretch. It's like uh, yarn made out of little twigs, as opposed to a spun type of fiber yeah. that that cotton would be. So I I, I prefer uh, a coarse linen, and they they can go to Dharma Trading, D H A R M A, T R A D I N G dot com because they have all types of fabrics. 
of, of different weights made yeah. for the crafter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, when, um, you say, when you say coarse linen, what thread count are you talking, thread per inch? Mm. You, you never look. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, but let me let me imagine. Twenty. Oh, 20 I was going to be. I was going to guess twenty. I was going to guess twenty. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. It's 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 much coarser than sewing machine thread or even um, the thread that you use to sew the buttons on. It's maybe more like that. But I also wanted to say to 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 your listeners who are interested in doing um, realistic work, to really um, put the time in when you're observing. Um, the reason I do realistic work is because I'm always after truth, truth and and beauty, mm -hmm. both. I, I like to combine the two, and because they tell you where to go in life. You know, if you don't know where you are, if you don't know the truth of your current situation, how do you know where to step forward to? You know, everything is accidental at that point. So I always aim for truth. And I want them in, in, in their art and in their lives to aim for truth first. And beauty, beauty and its effect on us is is calming and uplifting at the same time so i say aim for beauty as well but certainly truth and take the time whatever time it takes is worthwhile yeah until yeah. you find it all right ruth thanks a lot really enjoyed it thanks to everybody for listening <laughs>